Okay, folks, well, I think we'll make a start. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, great to see you all here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Matthew Jaron. I'm the museum curator here at the university. And we're really pleased to have the exhibition uh, that hopefully you've all had a chance to see outside in the Tarafoy, uh, exploring Nelson Mandela and his connections to Scotland and the anti-apartheid movement here. Uh, and we're really pleased that the two curators of that exhibition, uh, Matt Graham and Chris Fever, are, are with us uh, to give us a, a talk and tell us more. Uh, I should also say we do have copies of the wee booklet. Hopefully you've all picked up one, but there are ones at the front there. If you didn't get one, do free, feel free to help yourself at the end. Without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Tim. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, so hi, everybody, and a huge welcome to the launch of our exhibition, Scotland, Global Solidarity and Mandela. So thank you for all of you for coming out tonight to see what we put together. Uh, and hopefully you've had a good opportunity to look at the exhibition boards and also have a look at the display cases, which are also around the corner as well. So tonight we'll be talking more about anti-apartheid activism in Scotland, while specifically using examples from Dundee's contributions to this broader struggle. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Dr. Matt Graham. I'm a senior lecturer in African history here at the university. Yeah, and I'm Christopher Beaver. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of the Free State in Oakland, South Africa. And the exhibition itself is on until the 16th of December, which coincidentally the 16th of December is the anniversary of the launching of the African National Congresses and our struggle against the party regime in 1961, which is a complete accident. We don't have time to thank everybody who helped us put the exhibition together tonight, but I just want to give you uh, a few key thanks uh, for making it a reality. So first of all, the AHRI for providing the funding, uh, the Centre for Archives and Information Studies here at the University uh, for kindly allowing us to use the PITO collection uh, pictures, uh, which are, well, here is one of them, up on the screen uh, behind us. Uh, also, Glasgow Caledonian University Archive Centre for their anti-apartheid collection. The Anti-Apartheid Movement Archives Committee, who have very kindly given us lots of information. Uh, Dundee City Archives and also the Local History Centre at uh, Dundee Central Library as well as Matthew Jaron for helping this become a reality. Uh, and also finally to Eddie Small, uh, who helped this whole thing come together a few years ago. So we thought we'd start the evening by giving a brief uh, discussion about the origins of the exhibition itself. Uh, the exhibition stems from our collaborative research and teaching interests in South African history, the anti-apartheid struggle, and the various forms of political activism and organization that were taken in pursuit of uh, securing social justice, human rights, and democracy for the South African people. As part of my teaching on South African history, uh, one thing uh, I'm very keen to explain to the students, some of which are in the room uh, today, uh, was making those connections uh, with Scotland and South Africa. They're 6,000 miles away, so why should they care? Um, and the key issue is that the histories are closely intertwined um, especially uh, through the British Empire and the legacies of colonialism. For example, your historical fact for the evening is that there is a Dundee in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, which is where the South African War, or what is sometimes known as the Second Boer War, began in 1899, while there are 23 suburbs of Johannesburg named after Scottish towns, including a Blair, a Blair Gary and also a Dunkeld. So using our research interests as a starting point, we started to think a bit about Dundee's connections to South Africa, the struggle against apartheid, and the actions taken by Dundonians in support of this international cause. One example of this connection emerged back in 2014 when I was visiting the Nelson Mandela Foundation in Johannesburg, and the archivist there got really excited that I was from the University of Dundee. I should say that this is not the normal reaction I get <laughs> when I go to an archive. And at the time, the Nelson Mandela Foundation had on loan uh, some of the rarest photos in the world of Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo. Um, and they're pictured together in the booklets and on the exhibition boards outside. Um, and these were taken in London in 1962 by internationally renowned uh, photojournalist Michael Pito, who had snapped pretty much everyone famous from the 1940s through until the 1970s including the Beatles, Mick Jagger, Winston Churchill, and also Nikita Khrushchev. So when I returned to South Africa, I, was, I wanted to think a bit about how we could use the collection we have here at the University of Dundee 
and then also how we can connect this to our teaching and research interests. Yeah, it was also around about this the same time that I began um, to research Scottish anti-parkidactism as part of my master's dissertation at the University of Dundee. Um, and through this, I learned that Dundee had actually given Nelson Mandela free, um, free had made Nelson Mandela the free man of the city in 1985, uh, whilst he was still imprisoned in South Africa. This, yeah, this might not seem like a particularly con controversial act from the vantage point of 2022, but it was deeply controversial at the time. Uh, Dundee was actually one of nine UK cities which made Mandela a free man um, of the city, four of which were from Scotland, including Glasgow, Aberdeen, and the Glody. And I think this demonstrates a significant role that Scotland went on to play in the campaign to secure Nelson Mandela's uh, release. So despite having lived in the city uh, for many years and both Matt and I having a deep interest in South African history, the fact that Mandela had been given this honour was not something that we'd seen commemorated or really heard about um, in the years that we've lived here. And as we had looked into this even further, we discovered that part of the Wellgate, which includes the Central Library, the Steps Theatre and some of the conference rooms, was actually renamed the President Mandela Centre in 1997, although I'm not, I don't think we've ever, ever heard anybody describe it by that, even though that is still technically uh, its name. Um, I'll come back onto this in, in a second as well. So having stumbled upon these links between Dundee and the anti parking struggle, we've reached out to a number of archives, some of which Matt has already mentioned, um, to help us try and draw this story together through images, posters, and sort of other protest iconography. And then after I joined the University of the Free State in 2019, I made a similar trip to Matt and to the Nelson Mandela Foundation in the hunt to try and find the Freedom of the City certificate that had been given to Mandela by Dundee, which he kept as part of his personal collection. It was pretty clear when I arrived that I was probably the first person to, to ask to see this, um, the certificate, because it took quite a bit of finding um, from the archivist. And I was able to take a photo, and you can see the certificate in both the exhibition and I think also in the book as well. Um, I was also shown the numerous other tributes, particularly given the City Awards, honorary degrees, and lifelong memberships to different institutions that were given to Mandela by the people of Britain. Again, another fun fact is that Mandela is actually given lifelong membership of the University of Dundee Student Union, <laughs> although I don't think he was ever uh, fully able to utilise that privilege um, at all. Um, so the numerous tributes to Mandela were a testament to the impact of the anti party movement's campaign to build support in Britain for Mandela's release during the 1980s. And it was estimated in the, 19, uh, the late 1980s that around 70% of the British population supported his release from prison. Um, so as I mentioned just a minute ago, it was on the 20th of May 1997 that Dundee unveiled its permanent memorial to Nelson Mandela, which can be seen in the Wellgate Library. This event also marked the official naming of what I've described as the, the President Mandela Centre. The renaming of the complex was designed to pay tribute to Mandela, but importantly to celebrate Dundee's contribution to the struggle against apartheid more broadly. Councillor Robin Presley stated at the time that, quote, Dundee had a long history of radical support for international causes, which this plaque recognised. The decision to rename the complex also gained all party backing, which is something that was not the case when it came to the original decision to give Mandela freedom of the city in 1985, which is an issue that we'll return to later in this presentation. So Glasgow was the first city in the world to give Mandela freedom of the city, and this is a fact that many Glaswegians are either aware of and incredibly proud of. However, and despite Londonian's awareness and celebration of the city's radical past, there is far less recognition of the city's contributions to the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. As we mentioned, there is the plaque in the Wellgate, however, many people are either aware of its existence or simply walk past it, and I'm sure both Matt and myself have done that in the past as well. So it certainly seemed to us that this history had, seen, had slipped away from the con public consciousness since the late 1990s. We therefore wanted to create an exhibition that would spark renewed interest and awareness of Dundee's links to Mandela, its contributions to the anti apartheid struggle, and the lessons that we can take into the 21st century. So today's presentation will largely explore how the issue of apartheid played out in Dundee during the 1970s and the 1980s. We're not only going to examine the development of anti apartheid activism in Dundee, but also discuss how the international, international issue of apartheid impacted and intersected Dundee's politics, economy, culture. But first, I think we're just going to give a bit of a background on the anti party movement generally. So the, the international campaign against apartheid is often regarded as one of, if not 
the most influential transnational social movements of the 20th century. The British anti-apartheid movement was especially significant due to the close political, economic and cultural links between Britain and South Africa that, as I mentioned earlier, were forged through a shared colonial history. For instance, by the late 1950s, more than 30% of South African imports came from Britain, and the British received 28% of South Africa's exports. The importance of this economic relationship to the South African regime, as well as the many other political and cultural connections between the two nations, meant that the efforts of anti-apartheid activists in Britain really did matter. Apartheid had been established in South Africa following the surprise victory of the National Party in the 1948 election. It was a system of governance and legislation that organized all aspects of economic, political, and social life around race and was enforced by state violence and oppression. The implementation of apartheid generated significant opposition in South Africa and also internationally during the 1950s. In Britain, this was spearheaded by figures such as Archbishop Trevor Huddleston, who later became president of the anti-apartheid movement, anti-colonial groups such as the Committee of African Organizations, and the increasing presence of South African exiles such as Bella Pile and Tennyson Makawane. In 1959, and responding to the president of the ANC, Chief Albert Latuli's call for an international boycott of apartheid, the boycott committee was formed in Britain to build support for, um, for, for sanctions against South African goods. The success of this specific campaign and following the international outcry to the Sharpeville massacre in March 1960, which saw 69 people killed by the South African police, led to the official formation of the British anti-apartheid movement. The anti-apartheid movement supported the struggle for freedom and human rights in South Africa through a range of innovative campaigns, including pickets, demonstrations, boycotts, and fundraising, some of which we'll talk about in further detail later on. The aim was to mobilize public opinion to force the British government to impose sanctions on, on the regime, get companies to disinvest from the apartheid economy, and to uh, uh, isolate South Africa internationally in the sporting and cultural spheres, while also supporting the liberation movements, especially the ANC. Over its 35 year history, uh, the anti-apartheid movement fortunes ebbed and flowed in line with the political situation in Britain, as well as developments within the liberation struggle in Southern Africa. It was largely reliant on upsurges in internal resistance to apartheid to stimulate activism in Britain. Prior to the mid 1980s, the organization had enjoyed mixed success. The movement had grown steadily during the 1960s, largely driven by student activism, which Chris will talk about in a moment or two, However, its growth stalled during the following decade because of various factors. There was a downturn in internal resistance following the Ravonia trial in 1963 to 1964, which led to the imprisonment of key liberation leaders such as Nelson Mandela, the increased acceptability of the white minority regime in the West that was driven by Cold War dynamics, and the growing support for a constructive engagement approach in Britain, which stressed the need for dialogue rather than isolation as being the most effective way of achieving change in South Africa. But during the 1980s, the support for the anti-apartheid movement grew rapidly as renewed resistance within South Africa and the imposition of successive states of emergencies from 1985, as well as wider political opposition to the Thatcher government in Britain um, grew. The presence of the anti-apartheid movement could be found across Britain. And by the late 1980s, there were 187 local groups stretching from as far north as Inverness and as far south as Plymouth. As we'll outline in today's talk, Dundee was part of this story, uh, and we will talk a bit about that, uh, that activism and those actions. But first, as, the, 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 as I mentioned a moment ago, Chris will talk to you about the emergence of anti-party activism in Dundee in the 1970s. Okay, so in a general sense, students drove anti-party activism during the 1960s. Although we haven't found any um, record of action in Dundee um, in this period, this was largely likely to the fact that the University of Dundee wasn't formed until 1987, following the separation from St Andrews. The earliest example of anti-party activity in Dundee, we have found, concerns students who reportedly invaded the pitch at rugby match in St Andrews, involving a team from the University of the Orange Free State, um, ironically, the institution where I'm based, <laughs> in 1968 to express their opposition to apartheid. Labour MP Peter Hayne and Andre Odendar's recently published book, Pitch Battles, contains a really interesting description of what took place on that day to Andrews. And I'll just briefly quote from it. 
They said, the game at St Andrews University was disrupted for half an hour by 50 student protesters, despite being threatened beforehand with severe disciplinary action. A group of spectators chanting racist slogans were provoked to attack the demonstrators. Some protesters remained steadfast, <coughs> and later in the game there were further invasions. A dozen were arrested, unquote. And if you've had a chance to look at the display cases outside next to the exhibition, there are some articles from the student newspapers which talk about um, this particular um, rugby match and the political reaction to it um, in the day. <clears throat> it was a couple of years later, in November 1970, that the University of Dundee Student Association Council voted to ban the sale of South African goods in the Students' Union. Now again, how long the ban remained for um, is unclear, although exist its existence does tell us something about the level of support for anti-apartheid among the student body during the early 1970s. Another key aspect of student activism in Dundee around anti-apartheid at this time was fundraising, particularly in relation to the Southern African Scholarship Appeal. So the scholarships were broadly about targeting students in Southern Africa who had little access to higher education due to political, racial and or economic reasons. And the organisers of Dundee Southern African Scholarship Appeal estimated that they needed to raise four and a half thousand pounds for one student to spend uh, to complete a degree um, at the University of Dundee. The appeal, was, the appeal was driven largely by the student community, and with DUSA playing a really important role. From what, uh, just to give you one example, in February 1975, the Students' Union agreed to devote an entire evening's, uh, Friday night evening's takings to the scholarship fund, which I'm sure is not an insignificant number. <laughs> <laughs> There was also support from the university itself, which agreed to waive fees for um, the, uh, the, 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 the receiver of the scholarship. Again, we don't, we don't have um, a complete picture of how much, what the outcome of the appeal was, but we do have some evidence to suggest that it did at least continue until the early 1980s. So around this time, um, there's further action going on in, in the University of Dundee campus, and there was a flood of protests and demonstrations between 1974 and 1976. So Anti-Party News, which was the Anti-Party Movement newspaper, reported in December 1975 that over 200 students had held a rally organized by an organization called Dundee Students Anti-Party Group. They were, they were protesting the invitation extended to a South African embassy official by the university's conservative association. The rally took place in November and began in the city square before moving on to the Dundee Hotel where the meeting was taking place. The protest led to the meeting to be delayed. Significantly, this is the first reference we find to any formal anti-party organisation in the league. We have been told the group was formed by a student called Robert Watson, but we don't know that um, for sure, and we don't know how many people actually joined. However, the fact that they were able to mobilise around 200 students to take part in this rally gives us some indication of the support um, that it was able to, uh, to muster. Um, the November 1975 rally was then a catalyst for further activism by Dundee students, including a protest in February 1976 outside of the careers office where 3,000 leaflets were distributed, informing students why they should not take graduate jobs in South Africa. It was argued that British workers who emigrated to South Africa only served to, legi to legitimise the apartheid system and the British companies who were profiting from it. And again, if you have a look in the display case, I'm pretty sure there's an, an article from the student newspaper about that protest, about the protest outside of the students and careers office. So the, this upsurge in uh, student activity, which I've described during the mid-1970s, was driven by key individuals like the aforementioned Robert Watson. As well as establishing a student group, Watson also attended informal meetings of Scottish anti-apartheid activists in 1976 where he offered to host a meeting of Scottish anti-party activists at DUSA in June of that year. Now at this time, the main centres of anti-party activity in Scotland were Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow, so Dundee was quite a convenient location for the meeting. The June 1976 meeting in Dundee led to the formalisation of a new body called the Scottish Committee of the Anti-Party Movement. Now the creation of a national committee was an important moment in the broader history of Scottish anti-party activity, and Dundee was at the heart of this. It facilitated greater coordination between activists in terms of information sharing, and as well as enabling activists north of the border to prioritise and tailor the anti-party movement's campaigns to conditions in Scotland. And this was critical to the Scottish Committee's subsequent success, particularly during the 1980s. The issue of apartheid continued to be on the agenda of Dundee's students' population during the 1970s and 1980s. 
However, and given the transient nature of a student community, it proved difficult to sustain an active anti-party group, and activism on campus seems to have fluctuated. For example, another iteration of an anti-party group is listed in the university archives as having been formed in 1983, yet by 1986 this group was formally suspended by Dusa for purportedly being inactive. So it's really important to stress that the anti-apartheid movement did not only campaign on apartheid in South Africa, but was also active on political situations in Angola, Namibia, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. Across Southern Africa, various uh, uh, white minority regimes imposed numerous restrictions, including the denial of basic human rights, restrictions on opportunity based on race, and the suppression of free political organization. After the Sharpe massacre in 1960 in South Africa, and the unilateral declaration of independence by Southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, in 1965, most political opposition faced increasing repression, which resulted in many leaders either being arrested or alternatively being forced into exile. Due to Britain's colonial links to South Africa and Rhodesia, the country became a key destination for these exiles. So from the 1960s onwards, Southern African exiles played a significant role in organizing or participating in anti-apartheid activity in towns and cities throughout Britain as part of a concerted attempt to build international support for the liberation struggle. And Dundee was no exception, uh, with Zimbabwean lawyer Walter Camber and South African uh, Joyce Sikakani Rankin both leave it living here in the 1970s and participating in various anti-apartheid actions in Scotland. So after Rhodesian UDI, uh, Camber left the UK in 1965, uh, and he was appointed as a lecturer at the University of Dundee in 1969, where he worked here for more than 11 years, including as the Dean of the Law Faculty before returning to Zimbabwe after independence. While in Dundee, Camber participated in the Lancaster House negotiations that was a catalyst for Zimbabwean independence, acting as the legal advisor to the patriotic front leaders, including Joshua and Cornwall, and later President Robert Mugabe. Likewise, the journalist Joyce Sikakani Rankin had been ordered by the African National Congress to leave uh, South Africa in 1973, following an 18 month detention period for her political activism. She first moved to Zambia, where she was reunited with her fiance, Scottish doctor Kenneth Rankin, and after marrying, which was, I should stress, illegal under apartheid legislation, moved to Scotland. Uh, they lived in the Dundee uh, West Park area uh, between 1977 and 1980 uh, with their five children, after Dr. Rankin had taken up a position at the university. But through Kamba and Sikakani, Dundonians were directly connected to the liberation movements and the developments in Southern Africa. So both Kamba and Sikakani spoke at the opening meeting of the Dundee anti-apartheid movement, which was held on the 4th of October 1978 at the Unitarian Church Hall and was attended by 33 people. After the formation of Dundee's anti-apartheid group, the records show that both of them actively contributed to anti-apartheid activity, including rallies all over Scotland, um, Sikakani became a go-to representative of the ANC, and she also published her book at a window on Soweto while she was living here. Kamba, along with the other sizable Zimbabwean student population in the city at the time, led activities around the ongoing Lancaster House talks. For example, there was a march from Riverside to the city square in June 1979 under a big banner that said no sellouts in Rhodesia. However, by 1980, uh, both had returned to Southern Africa. But that said, numerous representatives of the various liberation movements continued to visit Dundee for the next decade to talk to activists and also contribute to ongoing mobilization efforts. These included the Lord Provost welcoming the South African Congress of Trade Union organizer, Andrew Molazzani to Dundee, who met prominent politicians and local trade unions while he was here. And then also Ruth Monpati, the ANC representative in Britain, also visited the city in 1983. Yeah, so Matt mentioned in there about the formation of the Dundee anti apartheid movement in 1978. And I'm just going to give a little bit of a brief early history of the establishment of an anti apartheid group in Dundee. So, like most local anti apartheid groups in Britain, Dundee anti apartheid movement's existence and level of activity fluctuated uh, following its formation in October 1978. It was relied on a number of committed, small number of committed activists to carry out its work. And the group's existence was therefore vulnerable to change in the personal circumstances of one or more of the group's core members. So by the winter of 1980, for example, it appears that the group had become inactive. There were consequently further attempts to revive the group, including in the summer of 1981, 
when Brian Filing, chair of the Scottish Committee of the Anti Party Group at the time, spoke at a meeting attended by 50 people in the Wellgate Library, which led to the re establishment of an anti party group in the city. Filing highlighted the importance of establishing a group in Dundee during the meeting because it would expose local firms that were investing in South Africa and help, to take, to help, to help them to take steps to disinvest. Our research indicates that the local anti party group experienced a further down, downturn in its activity in 1982. For instance, Anti Party News reported in May 1983 that the Dundee Group had been relaunched in February of that year at a meeting attended by 40 people. The report also stated that over 2,000 people had signed a petition calling on Tayside Regional Council to declare itself an apartheid free zone. Furthermore, the National Anti Party Movement's um, chair and the MP for Aberdeen North, Bob Hughes, um, had participa participated in a phone in on Radio Tay on the merits of the consumer boycott. The existence of an anti party group in Dundee then stabilised from 1983 through to the early 1990s, leading to one of the most active periods in its history as the domestic and international struggle against apartheid um, intensified. So anti party activists in Dundee were involved in many different and innovative types of campaigning that both had a national and also local focus. The, uh, this included the picketing of supermarkets uh, across the city. For exa uh, example, the William Lowe store, which is now the Sainsbury's on the Perth Road, the Overgate, and also on McAlpine Road, the Safeways in the Hilltown, and also the Tesco in the Wellgate. These pickets were designed to persuade uh, British consumers to boycott South African goods, such as fruit and wine. And the key thing is, it was not about boycotting the supermarket, it was about boycotting the goods that they were selling, uh, which, which originated from South Africa. Towards the end of the 1980s, local anti-apartheid activists, uh, clipboard in hand, um, carried out a survey of Dundee shops to determine how many of them actually stocked South African goods. We don't actually know the outcome of this survey, but it does show that activists were interested in looking at the links and looking at what was being sold in the various stores. It was, by the end of the 1980s, estimated that around a third of the entire British population were boycotting uh, South African goods. So these campaigns did have an impact. But one of the key connections to apartheid was through Dundee's Chamber of Commerce, where the Brewdog Pub is now near the McManus Gallery, uh, which sent a biennial trade delegation to South Africa to secure, to secure contracts and funding for the city. This link was enormously profitable, um, and also for those who believed in keeping the status quo, um, which was actually represented by the editorial stance of the Courier, which argued against disinvesting from apartheid. For example, in 1979, each member of the Dundee trade delegation was subsidized to the tune of between 300 and 500 pounds, and the mission brought in somewhere between one and two million pounds of new orders for the city. So these are considerable economic impacts for the city of Dundee. Furthermore, in 1983, on the next of these trips, um, the Dundee Chamber of Commerce received 1.25 million in South African government funding. This was the second highest um, of any delegation uh, of, of any of the British delegation in that year and highlighted the Chamber of Commerce's commitment to maintaining the city's links to the apartheid economy. The Chamber of Commerce uh, represented Dundee's most visible and tangible link to apartheid South Africa and was frequently protested throughout the 1980s. In 1985, for example, the Lord Provost Committee of the Dundee District Council urged them to stop sending delegations to South Africa and to break off links asserting that the Chamber of Commerce is, and I quote, a body in the city which seeks to cement relations with an inherently evil regime. A high profile demonstration was held in November of 1985 outside the chambers where guests reportedly, and I quote again, had to run the gauntlet of a crowd of anti-apartheid demonstrators. Despite these protests, the, the Chamber of Commerce remained unmoved and continued to deal with South Africa up until the, the end of this decade. The city square was the host of numerous anti-apartheid activities in Dundee, including street meetings, leafleting, vigils, rallies, and pickets. Uh, a unique aspect of campaigning in Dundee was the use of the 24 hour, or as it's listed up here on the 23 hour uh, picket. We have spoken to some of the activists and they're not really sure why it was 23 hours, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll pass that by. Um, but this, uh, this form of protest was actually influenced by the non-stop picket that was staged by protesters outside of the South African embassy in Trafalgar Square in London, which was maintained for 24 hours, seven days a week from 1986 
right through until Mandela was released in February 1990, so a significant commitment. As far as we are aware from the research that we've done so far, is that Dundee's anti-apartheid group was one of only a handful around the UK that took up this method of protest. In 1989, the city square also played host to the national anti-apartheid movement boycott bandwagon, also above my head here. Um, this was a double-decker bus that had been converted into a traveling exhibition space and also a cinema uh, and showed, um, showed a film called Fruits of Fear. The district council gave permission for the bus to park in the middle of the city square uh, and I'm sure that would have had quite an impact on the day it was here. Other forms of campaigning in Dundee included fundraising for the Southern African Liberation Movement. And again, based on the documents we've seen so far and the people we've spoken to, um, sponsored cycles appear to have been a particularly popular activity in Dundee. And we also know that there was like a local benefit uh, concert held on the Unicorn as well. Other cultural events, such as film screenings, were important in highlighting the situation in South Africa to the people of Dundee to actually visualize what was happening in the townships and also the violence of uh, the police state. So for instance, uh, Dundee organized a screening of, of a film called The Last Grave at Bimbaza, which was filmed clandestinely uh, by South African exiles and British film students to highlight the impact of the apartheid system. And if you're interested, you can actually watch this film on YouTube. So it's called Last Graves at Bimbaza. Moreover, in 1986, Dundee anti-apartheid movement organized a performance of a one-woman theatre show called 117 Days, which was based on the autobiography of Ruth First, a white anti-apartheid activist who was killed by South African uh, police uh, bomb in Mozambique in 1982. Yeah, so perhaps, perhaps the most impactful in anti-apartheid initiative, and arguably one of the, re the main reasons that we've done this exhibition, was the campaign to award Nelson Mandela freedom of the city um, in, the, in the 1980s. This was part of a worldwide drive to secure Mandela's rules, which had began in earnest only in the late 1970s. To increase international interest in apartheid, the African National Congress sought to personalise the struggle around the figure of Mandela. In Britain, a central feature of the campaign to raise public awareness about Mandela's plight involved the renaming of buildings and streets, as well as the bestowing of awards in his honour. The impact of this can be seen in the fact that Britain is understood to have the most streets named after Mandela, anywhere else in the world outside of South Africa, including, as I mentioned, Nelson Mandela Place in Glasgow. The campaign um, expanded in subsequent years and reached its peak in 1988 with the well-known Nelson Mandela 70th birthday tribute concert, which was held at Wembley Stadium. Dundee's connection to the Free Mandela campaign dates back to the early 1980s, when, in June 1981, the District Council, somewhat optimistically, wrote to the South African Embassy, embassy calling for Nelson Mandela to be released so that he could attend the Scottish Minor Gallery. And then from there on, Scotland remained at the forefront of this international campaign to free Mandela during the 1980s. In August 1981, a ceremony was held in Glasgow City Chambers, in which the Labour-controlled District Council awarded Mandela with the freedom of the city of Glasgow. As I mentioned, it was the first in the world to do so. This was a hugely important and symbolic act, given that Mandela was not even a free man in his own country at this point. In Scotland, Aberdeen followed a few years later in 1984, as well as, as, well as Nickelodeon in 1985. So Labour councillors in Dundee were inspired by their colleagues in Glasgow and Aberdeen to launch their own campaign in collaboration with the local anti-party group to award Mandela the freedom of the city in 1985. It should be noted that the Labour-controlled District Council had developed a bit of a reputation for radicalism and internationalism. In fact, it was the <laughs> organised political opponents has been the only district council in Scotland with a foreign policy. This largely stemmed from the um, from the from the city uh, from the council's decision in 1980 to fly the Palestinian flag on the city chambers and to twin Dundee with the West Bank town of Nablus. This decision generated a significant backlash in the city, although it did highlight the district council's willingness to engage in symbolic acts of international solidarity. To generate maximum support for the Free Mandela campaign across the city, but the anti party movement disseminated a petition calling for the District Council to give Mandela the freedom of the city and to continue to play its part in ending British collaboration with the party regime. And you can see a copy on the screen, and there's an original copy of the petition in the uh, case of as well. Um, it also calls for the unconditional release of all South African political prisoners. Now, between June and October 1985, the Dundee Group organised a series of events to generate support for the campaign. 
the symbol most notably a 23 hour or 24 hour ticket in the city square, and a rally was held in the amalgamated union of engineering workers follows. The rally was attended by over 100 people who heard speeches from the aforementioned Bob Hughes, as well as the district council itself, Dundee Trade Council, and the SNP. By the end of October, in excess of 4,000 Dundonians had signed the above petition. Now, to put this into that context, a similar petition that was launched in Aberdeen a few years earlier had only uh, managed to achieve 1,200 signatures, which I think highlights a significant level of support um, locally for the freedom of the city campaign in Dundee. And this was also reflected in various political sponsors, including local branches of trade unions, churches, and political parties. So shortly after the new anti-party movement had launched its campaign, the council meeting was held on the 27th of June, 1985. Councilors voted in favour of a motion stating that, and I'll quote, the district council should suitably recognise the achievements of Nelson Mandela by recommending that he be made an honorary free man of the city at the next meeting, and that an appropriate time be scheduled um, on the agenda for that meeting. This vote was then subsequently scheduled for the 31st of October, 1985. As councillors arrived um, at the city chambers for the October vote, they were greeted by placards holding anti apartheid demonstrators. Before voting, councillors were also addressed by a deputation of around 50 local organisations, including the local anti party group, um, who argued in favour of making Mandela a free man of Dundee. The public gallery in the city chamber was reportedly too small to accommodate the number of anti party supporters who had gathered to listen to the debate. Some supporters were forced to stand around um, the walls of the city chambers, while others stood outside the chambers chat shouting slogans, which could apparently be heard from inside um, the chambers itself. In the end, 29 of the district council's 43 councillors voted to make Mandela free man of the city of Dundee. This decision was welcomed by Nelson Mandela's eldest daughter, Zanani Delamiri, who reportedly said, quote, I am very pleased that my father has been given the freedom of Dundee. Like in Glasgow and Aberdeen before it, the decision to award Mandela the Freeman City was not universally welcomed in Dundee, as indicated by the 13 councillors who voted against the motion. Opposition to the motion um, came from the council's conservative group, who claimed that they opposed apartheid and supported Mandela's release, but objected to the alleged politicisation of the freedom of their city award. Instead, they argued it should be given to someone who had a specific, who had made a specific contribution to the city. Interestingly, the vote had pol political repercussions for the council's conservative group, as Andrew, Andrew Lyle, the local councillor from Gary Ward, voted in support of awarding Mandela the freedom of the city. This highlights how support for Mandela by the late 1980s could, at times, transcend party political agencies. And significantly, Lyle um, resigned from the local conservative group immediately after the vote of the final The local press were also opposed to Mandela becoming a free, free man of the team. The Courier editorial on the 1st of November 1985, describing the award as a quote, slur on Dundee. The Courier similarly questioned Mandela's connection to Dundee and believed that the decision would bring international ridicule to the city. Whilst they also provocatively pointed out that Mandela was a quote, convicted terrorist in his own country. And again, I want to reiterate that it may seem hard to imagine that uh, from the vantage point of 2022, but Mandela did not enjoy universal support in Britain during the pandemic. 80s, and the decision to make him a free man of Dundee was controversial. And perhaps this has influenced the way in which the city has remembered or not remembered um, this, this history. So, having made Mandela a free man of Dundee, the District Council decided to present him with an award at a ceremony in the Steps Theatre in May 1986. As Mandela was still imprisoned in South Africa, Solly Smith, who was the ANC's chief representative in the UK, and travelled up to Dundee to accept the award on his behalf. Interestingly, Solly Smith, who later died in suspicious circumstances in South Africa, admitted to being an apartheid spy. Um, the ceremony itself began with the screening of a film about Mandela, followed by the presentation of the Freedom of the City Award, and concluded with the play of the ANC's anthem. During the ceremony, the Lord Provost Tom Mitchell proclaimed that, quote, Nelson Mandela is a symbol of freedom which we in Dundee applaud. The citizens and councillors of Dundee hold this spirit in the highest esteem. So inside Dundee and Tayside Council, uh, apartheid was a frequent topic of debate during the 1980s, and one which actually had broader political ramifications in the city. After the Freedom of the City Award to Mandela, there was a number of anti-apartheid resolutions passed, 
and several initiatives to symbolically and financially support the liberation struggle. So at various points, the District Council donated money to Dundee's anti-apartheid group, the National Anti-Apartheid Movement, and also donated money to the ANC in 1989. But perhaps a, a good example of the symbolic solidarity, similar to the Palestinian flag, was a display of the ANC flag in council buildings on several occasions to show its support for the movement, which in turn sparked further opposition from within the chambers. The debates on apartheid within the council could be extremely heated uh, and reflected the broad UK-wide political and social fault lines over South Africa. In a council meeting in May and June 1989, there were multiple accusations of racism uh, and unsavoury behaviour in the chamber amongst the, the councillors, including a propaganda magazine produced by uh, British Petroleum about its South African operations being held at one of the councillors during this debate, forcing the Lord Provost to intervene. But these, again, demonstrate the strength of feeling that South Africa generated uh, in, uh, in this period. But in Scotland, the prime representative of the apartheid regime was the South African Consul General, who was based in Glasgow. The Consul General visited uh, towns and cities across Scotland, including Dundee, on a regular basis to bolster the regime's reputation, make the case against sanctions, and from 1983, sell the piecemeal reforms to the apartheid system implemented by the South African uh, Prime Minister at the time, P.W. Botter. Opponents of the apartheid uh, regime in Dundee protested the Consul General's uh, presence in the city, including the District Council, who frequently refused the invitations to meet uh, with him. Activists were also particularly critical of the amount of coverage that this person received uh, during uh, in, in the local media. Uh, and so uh, the Dundee anti-apartheid movement wrote a letter to the Courier in August 1985, where it was stated, and I quote, it is shocking that at the time when the brutality of the South African regime is there for all to see, a representative of that regime should be given the kind of coverage that the, Council Gen the Consul General was given. So to further break its international isolation and improve its reputation, the apartheid state had been stepping up its efforts across the 1980s to develop sympathetic um, ties with politicians and business people uh, to try and get them to think differently about South Africa and also to try and break the isolation. So the actions of the Dundee Conservative Council and leader of the opposition group at the time, a guy Neil Parry, thrust Dundee to the forefront of the, of the apartheid debate in late 1987. Uh, Parry was part of an eight person group, including three other Scottish Conservative councillors who had been invited on an all expenses paid 10 day fact finding mission to South Africa. The tour involved a visit to a township, meeting with politicians, from the National Party and also the far-right Conservative Party in South Africa and also with business leaders. However, the public opinion in Dundee had shifted considerably at this point. Paris' trip to South Africa generated extensive media coverage over the following weeks and actually turned into a local political scandal. It also created turmoil within the council and meant that many meetings and motions were passed during this period, criticizing his trip to the apartheid uh, South Africa. So the Lord Provost Committee, for example, um, urged him to resign as his position of the leader of the opposition, and a public statement was made saying, and I quote, that he had tainted Dundee. It also exacerbated existing tensions within the Conservative group at the time, and by early 1988, uh, Parry had been removed uh, as the leader of the Conservative group, with the Courier reporting that his visit to South Africa had, and I quote, brought things to a head and was damaging for the, for the local party, uh, um, yeah, for, for the local party. The implications, though, of Parry's uh, visit even reached Westminster, where the Labour MPs, um, uh, Ernie Ross, uh, who was also Dundee, uh, Dundee Labour MP, asked the Foreign Secretary in the House of Commons if, the, if uh, Neil Parry's visit to South Africa had marked an official change in the government's thinking at the time. So very briefly, Dundee was at the centre of the national political debate about British policy to apartheid. So, as we all know, how information is controlled and promoted has an enormous influence on how and, that, and what narratives are promoted to the public. And for the anti party group, this is an enormous challenge to overcome, given that most media coverage of South Africa, at least until the mid 1980s, remained supportive of the regime. And in an era where several big newspapers and a handful of TV channels dominated the news agenda, it was difficult for access to get an alternative version of events publicised in the national media. In Dundee, DC Thompson dominates the media landscape, and through its main publications, The Courier and The Telegraph, it 
its coverage of the anti partition rule could be described as at best unsympathetic. Looking through copies of these newspapers during the 1970s and 1980s, the coverage of anti party activity is in almost entirely absent, even when we knew through our own research that certain demonstrations and rallies had taken place in the city, in the city at, at certain times. The paper also adopted a right leaning editorial stance and supported the white minority states of Rhodesia, modern day Zimbabwe, and South Africa, while criticizing Southern African liberation movements and with a clearly racist tone in its depiction of African peoples. The papers also explicitly supported Thatcher and uh, the Conservative government in the 1980s, which in turn brought in its perspective that isolation and sanctions were counterproductive, and that the ANC and other liberation movements were terrorists in the embrace of Moscow. And this was te terminology that was frequently used at the time and reflected the Cold War dynamics of the anti apartheid struggle. When anti apartheid activism in Dundee was reported on, on the rare occasions it was, it was often framed quite unfavorably and sought to create an impression that the movement of the cause enjoyed little support in the city. And a good example of this was in November 1985, the day after Mandela had been given free man status. A courier reported in a box pop around the city with the article containing three supportive quotes and one against the decision. Yet the courier concluded that, quote, in general, the majority of citizens approached seemed unimpressed by the latest award of the city's highest honour. And this is a somewhat problematic stance given the evidence that they had presented themselves and the fact that there was no mention of the over 4,000 <coughs> people who had signed the petition calling for Nelson Mandela to be made a free man from the And just another great example of this type of reporting can be seen in the local newspaper's coverage uh, of a 24 hour or 23, <laughs> vigil that was held in the city square to coincide with the presentation um, of Mandela's speaking of the city certificate in June 1986. So rather than focusing on the event or the cause more broadly, the article honed in on a few technical glitches with the activist sound system, serving to create an impression of a dysfunctional organisation. And even after the party had ended, newspaper reports on the Mandela plaque unveiling and the renaming um, of the present Mandela Centre in 1997 um, dedicated nearly a third of the article to a single person's negative response to this decision. Although the courier was registered to report on anti party activism in the city, the lesser sections of um, the newspaper witnessed a very public struggle over South Africa taking place. This provides a good sense of the different arguments we put forward about a party at a local level. Anti party activists would regularly write in complaining about the lack of coverage for their events. The papers received support for the apartheid regime, including regular quotes from the South African Consul, as Matt mentioned. Um, and the misrepresentations they printed about Mandela and the liberation struggle. Although there were many letters printed that supported the apartheid regime, it is interesting that as the 1980s progressed, the number of anti apartheid submissions increased, reflecting how the issue had reached the mainstream of British political consciousness. So, as we kind of draw our, our talks for it, then during the 1980s, white politicians and business leaders had met representatives of the ANC, including Nelson Mandela, to discuss the basis of a future negotiated settlement to ending apartheid. Continuous violent and non-violent resistance by South Africans since the mid-1980s, the impact of the international economic, political, cultural and military sanctions, the plummeting morale of the South African white population, and crucially the end of the Cold War, combined to create the conditions that pushed apartheid state to negotiate. In a speech at the opening of the South African Parliament on 2nd of February 1990, President F.W. de Klerk announced the unbanning of the ANC and all other liberation organizations, as well as the release of political prisoners. Mandela's uh, release from prison nine days later was met with jubilant celebrations by anti-apartheid activists across Britain and around the world. Again, Dundee was no exception to this. The Lord Provost immediately invited Mandela to Dundee to receive his Freedom of the City Award in person, the ANC flag was hoisted above the city chambers, and local anti-apartheid activists organised a celebration in City Square to celebrate his release, and it was sponsored by over 100 local organisations, which you can see on the slide above me. Uh, sadly, the weather in Scotland's sunniest city let the, uh, the organisers down, but despite the conditions, uh, well over 100 people still attended the event. Speaking at the event, Dave Smith, the treasurer of the local anti-apartheid uh, group, stressed that Mandela's release brought hope for the future, but it did not signal the end of apartheid just yet. And this echoed the anti-apartheid movement's stance at a national level, which sought to maintain the international pressure on the white minority uh, government throughout South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy between 1990 and 1994. 
An anti-apartheid group continued in Dundee during the early 1990s, although unfortunately there is little record of his activities. However, from previous research that myself and Chris have done, is that this was a challenging period for the anti-apartheid movement, and by the time uh, of the Sarkis elections, most anti-apartheid groups um, had either disbanded or were struggling to maintain their activism. The highlight of this post-1990 period in Scotland was the visit of Nelson Mandela to Glasgow in 1993 to accept his nine Freedom of the City Awards, which he'd been given it's not possible for Mandela to visit each city or, or area, and Glasgow was chosen partly because it had been the first in the world to make, uh, that, uh, to make that decision, and it could also guarantee a very strong turnout. But representatives of each local authority area were given five minutes to talk to Mandela and to present him with his award in person. Dundee's delegation was made up of local politicians and councillors, the principal of the University of Dundee, and various religious figures. Uh, Lord Provost uh, Tom MacDonald, who was part of Dundee's delegation, stated that Mandela had thanked Dundee for giving him freedom of the city, which had been a source of great strength and comfort to him while he was imprisoned on Robin Island. And I think Mandela's sentiment encapsulates the importance of international solidarity to South Africa's liberation struggle. I should emphasize is that it was the people of South Africa that freed themselves from apartheid. But as we have covered in this talk, there, is, there was a global international activism which contributed to this struggle, and Dundee played a part in that. So this is a history that myself and Chris, and hopefully you now may agree, um, is that the city should recognise uh, in, in a greater depth for such acts of solidarity and support can, in whole, can hold important lessons to ongoing struggles to achieve racial equality, justice and human rights both at home and abroad. So thank you very much for listening.